Hello, saints. Peace, grace, and love of Christ Jesus be with all of you today. I hope everybody is doing fantastic out there. In our last study on Acts chapter 18, we saw how the Jews continued to attack Apostle Paul because of his lawless gospel. And thank the Lord we have a lawless gospel today in the body of Christ. Amen. The Jews hate Paul and the mystery revealed to Paul by our Savior, Jesus. Paul escapes the Jews, and he ends up in the city of Corinth. He preaches the gospel of grace. And once again, the Jews chase him out. And Paul, with Priscilla and Aquila, traveled to Ephesus. Now Paul, having shorn his head to keep a vow, leaves Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. And Paul heads to Jerusalem, then he travels north to Antioch to visit the body of Christ. From Antioch, he travels north again, traveling through the regions of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening the body of Christ. Also, Paul has to fight with the law-minded Jews at Galatia over their stubbornness to keep the laws, teaching that good works and keeping the Mosaic laws were needed to be saved and to keep their salvation. Now, Paul explains, if you read Galatians 3, how the body of Christ is, there's no need to keep the law. No need to keep placing ourselves under bondage. The gospel of grace is without the law unto Christ Jesus. And we also saw Apollos back in Ephesus, teaching that Jesus Christ was the Messiah and they needed to be water baptized. And Priscilla and Aquila, they take Apollos aside to explain to him a more perfect way. The baptism of the Holy Ghost instead of John's water baptism. Now I shared with you how John's water baptism was for the remission of sins, which is temporary. And they did not receive the Holy Ghost. Also, John's baptism was to distinguish believing Jews from non-believing Jews in the gospel of the kingdom, in the dispensation of law slash kingdom. Believing in Jesus as the Messiah or not believing, it distinguished, the, it distinguished the believers in the Messiah, the coming Messiah, or the non-believers. The believers got water baptized, the non-believers didn't get water baptized. Baptism by the Holy Ghost is very different. It's a permanent situation. You're sealed unto salvation. Two very different types of baptism for two very different reasons in two different dispensations. In John's water baptism, they were believing in John the Baptist's message that the Messiah was coming. They needed to repent and prepare for the arrival of that Messiah, Jesus Christ. There was no Holy Ghost involved in John's water baptism. The Holy Spirit baptism, however, you believe on Christ Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. There's two different baptisms. One is temporary and the other is permanent, sealing you in the body of Christ. And we see John the Baptist, his message in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here we see the kingdom gospel, the dispensation of the kingdom. And those Jews who were sincere about repenting would prove their faith by getting water baptized, showing the world that they really did believe that the Messiah was coming. It separated the believing Jews from the non-believing Jews. They got wet, but they didn't receive the Holy Ghost. Now let's compare that to our baptism today, the Holy Ghost baptism. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, that being Jesus Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You see, after they heard the gospel and understood the gospel, that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, is the Messiah, believing on Christ Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, after they heard that, 
the gospel of their salvation in whom also after that ye believed in that gospel what happens next ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory the purchased possession is us it's our body but the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance the baptism in the body of Christ is a sealing of the Holy Spirit of promise and again in verse 14 Paul writes that the Holy Ghost is our earnest uh, what is an earnest well the word earnest means promise or down payment we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise it's our down payment until we're physically glorified when our bodies change into glorified bodies of the rapture then the completion of the purchased possession takes place also look at one more verse 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21 now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath appointed us is God who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts again Paul uses the word sealed and earnest very different from the purpose of John's water baptism I'll remind you once again the book of Acts is a transitional book we're seeing the transition from the kingdom gospel to Paul's gospel of grace one dispensation over to another dispensation all the things that took place during the kingdom gospel are now diminishing and the next dispensation of grace is on the increase and is becoming more dominant which will last over 2000 plus years we know that now because hindsight is 2020 but Paul didn't know that he didn't know there'd be an extra 2000 years Paul thought the rapture was imminent that he was in the last days and Daniel's week was about to begin then it reverts back to the kingdom gospel to fulfill remaining prophecies involving the 12 tribes during Daniel's 70th week that's what it's all about reverting back to the kingdom gospel after the rapture to fulfill the remaining prophecies in the Old Testament involving who the 12 tribes the letter of Re Revelation is written to seven churches who are seven Jewish assemblies and we see the sealing of 12 tribes the 144,000 virgin males so the book of Revelation is all about Daniel's prophecy it was given to John in a more detailed vision of what Daniel had prophesied again it's all Jewish and again the body of Christ will be gone and that take place that takes us to chapter 19 we're going to continue our study about the baptism issue among some other things now this is the year 53 AD at this point in our study and by the end of this chapter we're going to be in the early year of 54 AD and Paul will write 1st Corinthians during this time so at this point you should have read Galatians you should have read 1st and 2nd Corinthians I mean Thessalonians and also 1st Corinthians and you'll have a very good idea what Paul's ministry has been like thus far if you go ahead and read those now remember the book of Acts covers Paul's entire life and his ministry 30 plus years also if you recall the reason why Priscilla and Aquila fled Rome was because the Jews were being persecuted by the Romans under the Roman Emperor Claudius well Claudius got what he deserved and his wife poisoned him and he died then we have the next Emperor which I'm sure you've all heard of before his name is Nero he becomes Emperor of Rome after the poisoning of Claudius so now Acts chapter 19 in verse 1 and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples so we see here Apollos if you remember was in Ephesus in the last chapter but now Apollos left Ephesus 
and he's now in Corinth. So now Paul himself is in Ephesus, where Apollos was teaching, but he was only teaching John's water baptism. And if you remember, we saw how Aquila and Priscilla took Apollos aside and taught him about the body of Christ, Holy Ghost baptism. Apollos now knows which baptism is correct, but he never had a chance to teach the body of Christ back in Ephesus. So here we see Paul teaching the correct back baptism to the Ephesians in verse 2. And he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. You see, they never heard about the Holy Ghost. Apollos didn't know either back then, and he never taught them. Verse 3, And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. John's water baptism of remission and repentance, to distinguish the believing Jews amongst the non-believing Jews. In verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Notice here in verse 4, it says, on Christ Jesus instead of in Christ Jesus. If you recall, John's water baptism was to determine who believed in the coming Messiah and who didn't. Also, they didn't receive the Holy Ghost with John's water baptism. In the next verse, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They go from believing in Jesus to believing on Jesus, and they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, I've explained the difference between believing in Jesus versus believing on Jesus in past studies. In case you haven't seen those, those videos, let me explain quickly what the difference is. Believing in Jesus was what the Jews had to do. They had to believe that Jesus was their Messiah. That's believing in Jesus. Believing on Jesus is different. In the body of Christ, in our gospel, we believe on Jesus, who he is, what he did, the death, burial, and resurrection. So believing in Jesus, they got water baptized to prove that they believed in Jesus. Believing on Jesus, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, our earnest, and this happens through believing on Christ Jesus and the gospel, what he did on the cross, the finished work of the cross. Two different baptisms for two very different reasons in two different dispensations. Kingdom versus grace, prophecy versus mystery. In verse 6, And when Paul had laid his hands on them, upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, we're really beginning to see the transition taking place from kingdom to grace, from prophecy for the Jews to mystery for the body of Christ. Two different programs. Verse 7, And all the men were about twelve. And he, Paul, went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, why would Paul be disputing here? Paul would be disputing with the law-minded Jews once again, trying to put the body of Christ back under the system of bondage, the Jewish Mosaic laws, keeping works to keep salvation, to work your way into salvation. That's all about the Jewish program, the kingdom gospel. They're going to have to continue working in their salvation, enduring until the end. The end of what? The end of Daniel's 70th week. And what are they going to do? What are they going to do when they finally realize that Jesus Christ was their Messiah? They're going to call on the name Jesus Christ. They're going to call on the name of the Lord, and Jesus will save them. The remnant of Jews who flee. The woman who hides in the wilderness is this remnant that will be alive at the end of Daniel's 70th week. These will be the people who call on the name of the Lord to be saved. 
Now, let me remind you once again that the Jews who rejected Jesus as Messiah were made partially blind. They hate Paul. They hate the gospel of grace. And they hate anyone who's in the body of Christ, doing everything they can to disrupt Paul's ministry. Also, let me remind you, not only did this take place 2,000 years ago, but this system of keeping the laws is very much alive today. We still see it in certain movements and denominations. Verse 9, But when diverse were hardened, and believed not, but spake evil of that way, that way being the body of Christ, the, the gospel of grace, before the multitude, he departed from them, Paul departs, and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks, Gentiles. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So God gives Paul some help to overcome all these obstacles caused by the unbelieving, law-minded Jews and also some Gentiles. We saw that in Galatia. But now, God gives Paul special ability to perform extraordinary miracles, even casting out demons, healing people on the spot, and also healing them by long distance. In verse 12, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them in verse 12 i i can't help but think about when i was younger 10 12 years old that would be 35 years ago i'm dating myself here when i'd see certain a certain wolf on television selling these little miracle cloths for money promising that anyone who bought one would receive a special blessing or healing or miracles. It wasn't long after that this certain wolf was arrested, was caught cheating on his wife, ended up in jail for tax fraud for many years. And now he's back on television and YouTube. He traded his little miracle clause for emergency food buckets. He's selling food buckets to help people prepare for Daniel's 70th week. And people are buying these things by the millions. Saints, my point is this. This world is filled with false believers trying to steal your blessings. Again, Satan stealing fruit from God's vineyard. Also, just like the Galatians, Ephesians, and Corinthians, these wolves are trying to put you back under the law so they can control you. And by controlling you, they also control your bank account. In verse 13, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. An evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. But who are ye? Here we see that it takes not just the name of Jesus to cast out demons, but you also have to believe on the name of Jesus, believing on his death, burial, and resurrection. Only believers can cast out demons, and it was only back then. It was in that last day's program, that period of time. These vagabond Jews had no idea who Jesus was. They just knew his name, and they paid the price for playing around with the enemy, too. Almost the entire world today believes that Jesus existed, but that doesn't make them a part of the body of Christ. Even the demons believe in Jesus, and they shake and shudder with terror just hearing our Lord's name, because they know he exists. Verse 16, And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped, on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded and this was 
was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it fifty thousand pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now it's estimated that 50,000 pieces of silver 2,000 years ago is well over $1 million in today's value. That's a lot of stuff. And that's a very, very big fire. Verse 21, After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he, Paul, stayed in Asia for a season. So Paul sends Timothy and Erastus to check on the body of Christ in Macedonia. Most likely they went back to Philippi, Thessalonica, and that area. But Paul himself stayed in Ephesus to continue his ministry there. And it's during this time in Ephesus that Paul would write 1 Corinthians. In verse 23, In the same time there arose no small stir about that way. Now, of course, whenever we see the phrase that way or the way, Luke is talking about Paul's gospel, the mystery gospel of grace, the body of Christ. Speaking of those who followed the gospel, that Jesus Christ was in fact the Messiah, and that he died, rose again, the third day, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. In verse 24, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Now, Demetrius and others sold their souls, basically, to make money by selling these curious arts books and figurines and idols made with hands that they just burned in this huge fire. And now no one was buying anything from Demetrius and the other men. So he's panicking because his business is going under. And of course, he's going to blame it on Paul and the body of Christ. In verse 6, 26, Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods, which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Just who is this fake goddess, the little g-god Diana? Well, in Roman mythology, Diana was the goddess of hunting, the moon goddess, the goddess of nature, also known as Mother Nature. She supposedly had the power to talk to and control animals. She was eventually equated with the goddess, the Greek goddess Artemis, originating from Italy. Diana, the fake goddess, was worshipped in ancient Roman neo-paganism. She was also known to be a virgin goddess of childbirth, also swearing never to get married. Isn't that interesting? The enemy, counterfeiting, the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus. According to mythology, Diana was born with her twin brother Apollo on the island of Delos, daughter of Jupiter and Latona. She made up a triad with two other Roman deities, Egeria, the water nymph, her servant and assistant midwife, and Verbius, the woodland god. Isn't it interesting? She had virgin birth, swore never to be married. She's called the moon goddess, mother nature. 
and also known as the Queen of Heaven, among other names. Saints, you can bet that she's still being worshipped today, perhaps under another name, but the same demon or demons are behind this entity. How many times in your life have you said the phrase, Mother Nature? That's something to think about. Also, the crescent moon that you see plastered all over Islam in movies and symbols goes back to Artemis and Diana, the moon goddess, the queen of heaven, mother nature, and so forth. What religion today worships the virgin queen of heaven? I'm sure you know which one it is. I could go on and on about all of this foolishness, but we need to finish up. So in verse 29, and the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Paul's companions go into the theater, but Paul doesn't go in. He stays outside. In verse 32, Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the most and more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with one hand, and would have made his defense unto the people, but when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana? and of the image which fell down from Jupiter. The image that they say fell from Jupiter is no doubt a meteorite that made it through the Earth's atmosphere, so these people are worshipping a rock. Go figure. Where else do we see people worshipping a big black cube today? Supposedly some mysterious object. Verse 36, Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, Ye ought to be quiet, and to do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them plead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. In our last verse, And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Now, to recap our study today, Paul comes back to Ephesus. We see how the Holy Spirit baptism versus John's baptism permanent versus temporary. Paul performs extraordinary miracles with cloths and handkerchiefs. The Ephesians burn over a million dollars worth of books, statues, occultic paraphernalia. And then we see the seven sons of Siva, fake believers, exorcists. They get beat up by demons. And then Demetrius loses money in his business and he complains about Paul. He blames it on Paul. And then we saw Diana, Artemis, a false goddess, moon goddess, mother nature, crescent moon, virgin birth, she never marries, counterfeiting our Lord Jesus, worshipping a meteorite, the image of Jupiter, cube worship that goes on even today. The city official talks to the crowd in a theater worried about the way attracting too much attention and causing businesses to lose profits. So, dear saints, that's it for this study, Acts chapter 19. Peace, grace, love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you next time for a study on Acts chapter 20.